Our gospel reading this morning comes from Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. And Jesus said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must first be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be servant of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many." So I'm going to tell you a story that I think I've told in worship before, but I'm telling it again because it's very fitting for today's theme. It's also not that memorable, so if you heard it before, you probably forgot. <laughs> and there's an update at the end, so if you heard it and you remember it, there is a little, a little bit of a change at the end of my story. So I had an ecclesiastical council in 2012. This is an important step in someone's journey towards ordination in the United Church of Christ. It's towards the end of the candidate's process. The ecclesiastical council takes place at the candidate's home church. And I gave a presentation about my theology and my call to ministry and my understanding of why I wanted to be a pastor. And after I gave my presentation, the people who were there, which included people from the wider church as well as people from my home congregation, they were able to ask me questions. And when the question and answer time was over, everyone there took a vote on whether I should become a candidate for ordination. So it's a pretty big deal. And at my ecclesiastical council, someone asked me a question, and I actually don't remember what it was. But my answer entailed telling them that I live to serve. I understand my life in such a way that I feel called to live in service to God and to Jesus and to humanity around me. Later that evening, I was at my parents' house with my two brothers. <laughs> My two brothers were at my ecclesiastical council. I have an older brother and a younger brother. I am right in the middle. And they started to tease me mercilessly for saying that I live to serve. Because from their vantage point, up until that point in my life, I had not shown demonstration or demonstrated that I lived my life in such a way that I was in service to them. <laughs> And so they were teasing me, which is fine. I have very thick skin. They were doing their job, as brothers are supposed to do, which is to keep their siblings humble and honest. So that's fine. Fast forward more recently, one of my brothers actually brought this up again. And he said, okay, you have been ordained for 12 years. I will concede that maybe you are living your life in service to the church. To which I said, thank you very much. <laughs> So that brings us to today's gospel lesson. We are back in the gospel of Mark, where we've been for the past several Sundays. We have another interaction between Jesus and his disciples. This time, he's talking to James and John, the two brothers. 
And they ask him, Jesus, we want to sit at your right and your left. And of course, he admonishes them and says, you don't know what you are asking of me. But there's some interesting context that I want to share with you surrounding this story that might help us get a fuller understanding of what the disciples are thinking. So immediately before this interaction, in Mark 10, 32, we're told that the disciples are afraid. The disciples are often afraid in ministry with Jesus because he's constantly asking them to do things that are outside of their comfort zone. Additionally, earlier in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 9, we're told that when Jesus tells them he's going to be killed and rise from the dead, they don't know what that means. In fact, by this point in the Gospel of Mark, he's foretold his death and resurrection three times to his followers. He's told them that he will be killed and rise from the dead, but they don't understand what he's saying. So James and John are approaching Jesus from a posture of confusion and fear. They know something bad is going to happen, that he's going to be killed, but they don't know what all this rising from the dead stuff means. And so they are seeking security and reassurance. They want to sit on either side of the throne of King Jesus, which we know is not the way the story unfolds. But they literally want to be in close proximity to him so he can protect them from whatever lies ahead in their future. The theologian David Loos is a Lutheran theologian, and he says that one of the pernicious illusions about being human is this idea that we can live our lives completely devoid of all loyalty and bonds to anyone or anything beyond ourselves. He says that is simply not true. It is an illusion to think that we live in silos, completely disconnected from the complicated interconnected networks around us. The point is that all the decisions we make, how we spend our time, who we spend time with, how we spend our money, what careers we pursue, what jobs we have, who we're in relationship with, all of these things have ripple effects and impact the world around us. And so we have a choice. We can joyfully follow the will of God and live our lives in service to the common good and to the greater humanity, or we can seek the illusion of security by seeking power and status and rank. But we know that security is a fallacy because awful things can befall any of us. Nothing can insulate us from the hardships that affect us as humans. And so it's better for us to be in community and relationship with other people so that we have a safety net when awful things happen and we have that support network. So the question is not if I'm going to live in service to something beyond myself. We all are. We all inevitably do. The question is what? Some of you may be familiar with that Bob Dylan song written in the 1970s, You Gotta Serve Somebody. Great song, lots of wonderful lyrics, as is true to Bob Dylan. Um, but the refrain is, you gotta serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord. You gotta serve somebody. The point being, you have a choice. Who is it going to be? What's it going to be? It's not if but whom. And if we're being honest with ourselves, I think a lot of us, just like James and John, make decisions from a posture of fear. How many people have chosen careers, not because it was what you were necessarily called to or excited about, but because you knew it would provide a living wage and a stable paycheck and job security? How many people chose to marry someone not because it was a love marriage and it was the person who made their heart sing, but because they knew they could provide for them? How many of us have chosen to live in a community not because we love the idea of living in that city or that town, but because it has a good economy and we'll be able to succeed there? I will be honest that when I was making my calculations about whether to go into ministry, it was not completely altruistic. Yes, I was trying to follow the will of God, but it was also a very practical decision. I knew it would provide a stable paycheck and a living wage, depending on which church I served. And also it would allow me the freedom and flexibility to be present for my family and to have a family. I didn't want a nine to five job that would keep me at a desk Monday through Friday. 
So even I made really practical considerations in deciding which path to pursue. How many times have local churches made decisions trying to shore up their own security and future, not necessarily following the call God has placed on them at that moment in time? It is so common. And I listed up examples of big decisions we make in life, like careers and who we marry, but we also make smaller decisions throughout our lives, not necessarily from a place of putting all of our faith and trust in God, but trying to secure our own security and future. So James and John approach Jesus because they want him to protect them and insulate them from the rough world in which they're living in. Now, Jesus quickly disabuses them of this idea and says that I came not to be served, but to serve. And let me set the record straight, James and John, that to sit on my right and left is not next to me at the head of the banquet table to receive praise and adulation from all our honored guests, but in fact, to follow me is to get on your knees and wash the feet of the people sitting at the places of honor at the banquet table. And he invites us to follow what Henry Nouwen calls the path of downward mobility. Downward mobility through the valley of humility to the foot of the cross. Not upward mobility, not seeking power and status and rank. As he says, I am not a tyrant that has come to lord power over you. To be, but to be in service to you. I came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve. And so the question he asks all of us, do you drink from the cup that I drink from? Were you baptized with the same baptism that I was baptized with? What he's asking is, are you going to walk this journey with me? Because we know the only people who ended up on the right and left sides of Jesus were two common criminals who were crucified next to him on that hill on Golgotha. Not James and John, no one of power and status and rank, criminals. And one thing I love about Jesus, I love a lot of things about him, but one thing I find so incredibly admirable about Jesus is that he never asks his disciples or his followers or us today, he never asks any of us to do anything he himself is unwilling to do. I think that is the mark of an incredible leader with true integrity. I think we should all be suspicious of leaders in politics or business or organizations or in the church who ask the people around them to do things they're not willing to do. I think that's the mark of a coward. But Jesus says, this is what I'm doing. Do you have the faith and the courage to come alongside me? And right after we hear this interaction with Jesus and James and John, the Gospel of Mark leads straight into Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. We call that the Palm Sunday story, right? When he's heading into Jerusalem for the Passover feast, he knows he's going into the eye of the hurricane. He knows where he's going. He knows the authorities in Jerusalem are waiting for him. And of course, that Passover feast precipitates his trial and crucifixion. So he's literally about to show him what it means to be a servant leader, literally laying down one's life for one's friends. And so who are we to say, Jesus, I want to follow you, but that servant leadership stuff is a bridge too far when he was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. Earlier in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus asks his disciples, what good is it to gain the whole world and lose your soul? The King James Version says soul. The New Revised Standard Version of the Bible says life. But the point is, what good is it to gain all this world has to offer? Power, status, rank, all the material possessions you could fathom, the biggest house you could ever dream of. What does it matter if you've lost your soul? if you realize you didn't actually live for anything that matters. So when he says, do you drink from the cup that I drink from? What he's asking us is, what is it that you want to live for? What matters to you? And what is it that you're willing to die for? These are really big questions. So yes, in my ecclesiastical council, I said I live to serve, but that's not actually very remarkable. We all live to serve something beyond ourselves. 
As Bob Dylan said, maybe the devil, maybe the Lord, is it the almighty dollar, is it something else? Are we going to seek upward mobility, seeking power and status and rank and chasing that illusion of security? Or are we going to have the courage and the faith to follow downward mobility, following Jesus to the foot of the cross, paying ultimate homage and loyalty to the servant leader who gave his life for us? Amen.